Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am honored to be here. Uh, when I say I'm honored to be here, I'm honored to be here in India. Um, I could say I'm a mixture of an iguana and an elephant. <laughs> half Costa Rica and half India. And by these uh, blessings of my karma, I have been able to travel to your country for many years. And this job as an ambassador has become a, a dream come true for me. I always like to say that most of all, above all, I am a mother of seven children. Wow. And it's because of them, the millennials that you were saying, <laughs> that I keep up with technology. And it's also because of them why I am here, living in India now, away from them. Um, and since I was invited to, to this event, I. I thought a lot about what leadership means in these times of change, in this time of technology. And uh, my dear friend that we just met, but we have been sisters probably in past lives, maybe. <laughs> 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 an instant connection. You spoke about spirit. And I think India's uh, gift for the world in this 21st century is spiritualism. That's the only way we can protect ourselves from the dehumanization of technology. And that's the only way to keep ourselves grounded. And as parents, and as teachers, and as human beings, we need to know that we cannot lose our own humanity in face of this uh, progress, as you want to call it. I have my phone, and sometimes I wish I didn't have it. Uh, I don't really have time for myself. I'm always on the WhatsApp answering. <laughs> I feel sometimes like I'm a slave. Even when I do my yoga practice in the morning and Costa Rica is waking up, I am answering things from my work and from family. And, you know, I miss the times when they're we're just like that wall phones, you know, <laughs> that where they're stuck and you had a life and then you would go to the phone on and off. And, and even though the computer has accelerated our, you know, our lifestyles and it connects us and in a way I feel the connections are very shallow. It's very strange. We are connected. I have, I have 5,000 friends in Facebook. And I don't even know who they are. <laughs> Sometimes they write me, but you know, I don't know them personally. I, I miss having a cup of coffee with someone. <laughs> it gets very fast. So I was in a global leadership forum in Bangalore uh, last November. By the way, you probably saw me in the news because uh, I fell sick after I spoke in this forum. Uh, my Costa Rican lungs are having a little trouble with uh, daily pollution. So I felt sick there in Bangalore and it also gave me time to meditate about what leadership is. Um, what about authentic and meaningful relationships? And as a, as a yoga student, I wouldn't say a yoga teacher because my teacher is a teacher. As a yoga student, as a yoga passionate, I traveled the world teaching this science and this art. Before coming here, I had my yoga studio in Costa Rica. I was traveling in America and Europe and Asia. And I know how thirsty people are for something uh, warm, for something that connects our hearts. And, and since you are a cardiologist, you know like people, when they are so sad and lonely, they have a heart attack. That's, that's why the heart just bursts into pain. And if we can address that as leaders, then we can really uh, create a transition that has le less impact in our children. I, as I said, you know, I'm a mother, I'm also a grandmother, my, my daughter just had a baby. I'm protecting my children from technology. My, my son, Gael, he's 10. Oh, my mom, when, where is my cell phone? No cell phone after you're 15. Are you crazy? <laughs> All my friends have cell phones. And 
Yeah, it's protecting them somehow, uh, creating, creating a, a cushion for them. How do we do that? And I see, you know, children here in the audience. I'm so happy that you're here in India. My four, uh, I have like two batches. My first marriage, I have four children, and then my second marriage, I have three little ones. The older ones have already been to India. And two of them live in Germany, and for them to come to India was a cultural shock. And they got the deli belly, you know, the <laughs> sickness. They were like in chutney choke. I brought them there. Chutney choke is like, you have to go there. It's like all deli is beautiful. I love it. They were like walking in Nizamuddin. I took them to Akawali. And then they had to go barefoot to the bathroom in Nizamuddin. Wow! And then my son Gabriel, that I thought he would be like, oh, at the end he said, Mama, thank you so much for showing me. I look forward to come back to this country and study here. He's becoming a lawyer also. So our children need to be exposed to the beauty and contrast of human beings everywhere. In America, sometimes we hold a concept about India, about Asia, and that's exactly what I have been breaking in my own life for 16 years. I felt I was too comfortable in my life. I had all my needs, my car, my AC, my Costa Rican beauty, like, it was too easy. And as a lawyer, I was looking for some deeper meaning. And <coughs> India has answered many of my questions, but at the same time it has brought many, many other questions, deeper and deeper by the day. Um, I'm so grateful. And, and what is a leadership, a leader for me? What is true leadership? So I'm going to review a little bit about my notes from this forum that I was in. How does a leader reinvent himself or herself? And um, in our life, in our personal life, in our career, how to do that in this uh, ocean of technology that is drowning us all. How do we keep our basic humanity intact? The answer for me, and since I've been living here in India by myself, my children are spread all over the world. I'm not with them, and that has been a, an edge that I never experienced before, a big letting go. The only way is to have a spiritual <coughs> practice. And, and what is a spiritual practice, actually? A spiritual practice is whatever connects you to to your own self. It could be your medicine practice, it could be your cooking, it could be your motherhood, it could be your career, uh, your service especially. How are you serving other people? In, in India they call it seva, I love it. It's, India is so much into devotion. How do you uh, honor your guests? How do you receive them into your home? How do you give them food at the same time how do you help those that are less privileged than ourselves? So a leader must promote uh, selfless service somehow. And even if we're not like uh, connected to a foundation or something that is it's working outside an NGO, or whatever, if we can do it in our personal lives, how can we be more kind to each other? That's service in itself. So the first point is, how do we reinvent, reinvent ourselves from selflessness? Because so many leaders come into power and they come to profit from power instead of serving. And that's the change, the vision that I am uh, actually learning in my own uh, life because I was a mother, I was a lawyer, and then I became an ambassador all of a sudden. It's not my call, it happened. And coming into these um, jobs of high responsibility, representing your country in another country, means you also have to reassess in yourself, what do you really want to represent? And Costa Rica, for me, is such an easy country to represent. You all know Costa Rica is in the heart of Central America, it's so tiny, but it's magnificent in energy. Costa Rica is pure green forest. It's like a jewel, it's like a turquoise, like an emerald. 
is surrounded by pristine oceans, even though in this plastic like craziness that we're going on, still the beaches in my country are clean. We have no army since 1948. We devote all that money to education and peace and health. So I was raised and I was born in paradise. And all of a sudden I became bored somehow. I was like, no, there must be something else. There must be something else that I need to know about. And that's when India called me. And when I found my teacher, I knew I had come to the right place. So even though in the surface, sometimes we may get confused about, oh my god, maybe this is not too comfortable, maybe this is too hot, maybe this is not my normal surroundings. There's something deep and profound in this land. And you're going to feel it as you walk. You're going to feel it when you eat. Like my friend was saying, you're going to feel it in the gestures of the people, in their warmth, in their welcoming. My friends here in Delhi have become my family. So uh, how a leader connects to, to the people, for me, is the most important and more uh, highest responsibility. It's not connecting so you can do business, no. It's connecting first, and everything will stem from that. So education needs to address that. We cannot keep uh, feeding the rat race concept that we have in America. I was raised with the rat race concept, so much stress in my life. I was the top A student in law school. I had my three master's degree. More, faster, go, go. And I was deeply, deeply, like, empty. So India came and just poured into my heart all the wisdom that I was lacking in the West. We need spirit in the West. We need leaders to come here and cry and walk the streets and connect to the children and, you know, embrace everything as, as humans because we're all one. We are all one love. And if there's one child that is suffering right now, we are suffering. Some of us choose to go into denial and turn on, you know, Netflix. <laughs> and some of us choose to open our eyes. How to open our eyes to everything, to pain and joy, to life and death? Have a spiritual practice. And if you are blessed enough to find a spiritual teacher, oh my God, that's the best karma ever. So even if you haven't found one, pray for one. Leaders need to have support. We cannot be here and give and give and give and give without receiving from someone. In my Shangri Yoga uh, lineage, we call it Parampara. I am here and I can speak to you, even though in my law school I used to be so shy. I didn't like speaking. I like making papers, but not speaking. I can speak to you because I have grown from my teacher example. What is the second quality of a leader? The leadership is the ability to consciously act on the right thought or on the right emotion in the crowd of thoughts and emotion that are jostling continuously in our mind. How can we calm the mind? Because if a leader is disrupted, if a leader is uh, sad, if he's angry, he will take measures that would affect other people negatively. It's a huge responsibility just to take care of ourselves first. So many, when I, I, I would do my yoga practice every morning for two hours, many would say, oh, you're so selfish. You have seven children to take care of. And you know, if I did not do the yoga practice, my kids would say, mama, you are angry today. Go do your yoga practice. <laughs> <laughs> and they would be my first, uh, you know, supporters. So each one of us, and as women, you know, as women, we have so much in our hands because now we have careers. But at the same time, society is expecting us to be the perfect wife, the perfect mother, and the beautiful, and the, you know, perfect. And that's so much pressure on us. It's not fair, you know, men have their wives to support them. <laughs> we basically, we don't. We have to <coughs> carry two loads. So as women, we definitely need support first from our sisters. 
So, because if more of us are doing the same thing, if we're taking care of our minds and our hearts and our bodies, then more of us will give themselves permission to do that. So, how do we choose the right thought in the right moment to create an impact, to promote an action that benefits others, that makes us happy and joyful and satisfy? It, it's a it, it's not easy because sometimes you are worried, sometimes we have like attachments and we have like previous past pains and everything becomes like this salad. And in that salad we need to be able as leaders to pick up the only and one thought that fits the situation in the moment. Um, and that's an art. And how to know ourselves so well that we know when we're acting from greed, or ambition, or fear, or wrath, or different, like, I'll call them like lower emotions. A leader needs to bring the best in themselves. And then they can say something. If not, it's better to be quiet. That's <laughs> my... Uh, the third point is about ethics. A leader who is solidly based on a strong ethical foundation is fueled by sustained intrinsic energy and has a drive for excellence and creates this aura of power around them. And we all know uh, leaders that have had like an impact. I was listening the other day to um, Martin Luther King and I'm so proud I was sharing that in El Costa Rica, we just elected our new government. Our president is 38 years old. Can you believe that? This is the new generation is coming. And our vice president, she's the first Afro-American woman to be vice president. And only, not only that, she's the first Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And those changes in generations, those changes in perspectives, that really nourishes who we really are, because we are all one. It doesn't matter what color of the skin, what religion, what uh, household we were, what name we have. And here in India, it's, I know it's, it's part of your tradition. It's been hard for me to swallow this thing about the castes and this thing about the arranged marriages. And I actually have a good friend of mine that he, his wife divorced him. It was his karma. And now he feels his health, he is like a second quality uh, groom. He's, oh, I'm not getting enough proposals, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? And he's handsome, he's 38 years old, I mean, in, in America he would be a hottie. <laughs> and here he's discriminated because, you know, something happened to him that was beyond his control. These things need to change, and, and for you, those of you that are Indians, I know that you can listen. And for us Westerners, we, we also need to understand that any type of discrimination is absolutely, and, uh, it's absolutely off. We, we all share the same yearnings for purpose, the same uh, longing for peace, and that's the job and the example of our leaders. The leader must sustain their energy first, take responsibility, and of course, of course, they need to have high integrity. And how do we develop that integrity? We need role models, of course. My own personal path in yoga, we have ten, uh, they're called the yamas and the niyamas. They're like the ten commandments that I learned in my Catholic school. Basically, is do not harm. Be true to yourself. Uh, don't steal. Mm, moderate your desires. And in a in a deep way, find detachment of whatever creates havoc in your soul. And if a leader can really live up to those uh, principles, then they can offer something valuable. Otherwise, power corrupts, and we have all seen many leaders fall, 
I've seen many of my teachers in the West, in the yoga community, fall back. And they were very good teachers, but suddenly power just overwhelmed them. And the head needs to be clear, the soul and the heart needs to be at peace. And then we can actually offer something valuable. Then I have another one that it says, how can we be of service to others as leaders? And that takes a little effort every day when we wake up. And after our prayers or after our, whatever we do, take a moment to think of someone that it's in need that day. And go beyond your comforts. Go beyond your mini-me state and offer a hand. And it can be an what's up. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it can be a what's up, just a little heart. By the way, I get a lot of hearts from Costa Rica, <laughs> which is have been really supportive, uh, my friends of my tenure here. And um, I would like to offer you my hand to all of you here. Somehow we are here together for a reason. And I would like to invite you to come to my country. My country has a vibration that is very special. And as any other country, we have problems, and we have corruption, and we have, but at the same time, there's a vibration just like in India. In India, so many people uh, have been enlightened in this land. So as you walk, you know, the streets, as, as you take the bus or the rickshaw or whatever, know that this land is vibrating that knowledge into your, into your cells, into your DNA. And it's going to have an impact. And if, if you have been fortunate enough to be in India at a young age like you, oh my God, that's going to change your perspective. I came to India the first time when I was 33 years old. I was like, you know, I had to like get material in my life to find this space of uh, emptiness. But if you are here and young, and if you manage to come back here many, many times, you have very good karma. So uh, I offer you my hand as a Costa Rican and as a as an ambassador as well. Please come to my country. Please know who we are. I dream of 30. Costa Rican students here. Yes. Uh, not only here, but in, in this amazing, beautiful country that has changed my life forever. <laughs>